Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Justin Murphy, education reporter at the Democrat and Chronicle, and uh, we're here today to talk about the, the district's budget for this year, which, uh, as you probably know, is, is a little bit problematic. They've had to cut um, about $85 million from what they originally were proposing, which itself was uh, less than what they hoped they could fit. And I've got here uh, a couple of um, veterans of the uh, district budget process. Uh, so if we have any questions that are answerable, they should be able to answer them. Uh, there's uh, Melanie Funches. She's a former school board member, a longtime special education advocate in the district. And um, she's the director of community engagement at the Mental Health Association of Rochester. Good morning, Melanie. Good morning. And the other one there is Eamon Scanlon. He's the education policy manager at the Children's Agenda, which is a uh, education research advocacy organization in Rochester. And before that, he was doing similar work at uh, Metro Justice. Hello, Eamon. Hi, everybody. Um, and they have both um, spent uh, a lot of time with this year's budget and also with past budgets. So we um, should be able to get into a good bit of detail here. Mel first thing I'm, I'm wondering um, if you can kind of put yourself back in your shoes as a board member, what's it like to get the budget and in particular one with such bad news like this one, how do you go about parsing it, reading through it and kind of sorting out like what your response and, and what you're going to do with it as the elected official who's ultimately responsible for passing it? Well, for me, I know that budgets are a physical manifestation of our values. So for me, when I'm looking at a budget and something especially as bad as this, I'm starting to think, okay, how can I, how can we figure out how to do this and still hold true to what our values are? How can we stay as close as we can to what our values are and what we hold most dear and do what we have to do to, to with what we have? And I would not, and I have to say up front that I do not envy my former colleagues at all in this situation. They are between a rock and a hard place. And so I know that this is a horrible thing, but at the same time, for me in that space, that's that's the preeminent thing. How do we say, knowing that this is a, this is a manifestation of our values. And if our values are to be educators and to, look out for the least and the most vulnerable of our children. How do we do that with what we have? So, so um, let us hear your, your fast analysis, um, you know, based on those priorities, how well do you think Superintendent Day did in meeting them? And, you know, we'll acknowledge again and again, as you did, no way that he was going to put out a budget that made everybody happy. If somebody, if things were going to get cut, students were going to be uh, hurt, but how, how do we think he rose to the task? Um, uh, me personally, I, because of where, where my leanings are towards special ed, um, I don't think he did very well. Um, personally, I don't think he did very well. I think that, um, in looking how the, how the weight of this was distributed, I don't think there was equity, it was equity, the, the, the hurt was not equitably distributed across. And I may, and that may, and that may, and I'm going to openly say that that some of that may be my own bias, but I believe that the numbers will bear that out. Okay. Eamon, one of the really useful things that you do every year is put out a, an analysis um, of the budget, not just the, the budget, but also the budget process. And you did that last year. We'll, we'll post a link to that as we have before. But um, what about you when you went through it in some detail? Um, how would you assess uh, the job that the superintendent did with this proposal? So I, I echo what Melanie said around the, the difficult position that the superintendent's in. And I want to stress that the things were going to be cut. That was inevitable. Um, but the, the weight of the cuts were definitely on the backs of the most vulnerable students. And special ed was hit the hardest. Uh, but then also uh, social emotional supports and English language learners uh, had a lot of cutbacks as well. So it seems like the areas that were uh, targeted to improve over the last few years uh, were all reverted back to where they were and the challenges that we've seen in, in past. So 
uh, that is not really the best approach. There was a reason uh, those uh, specific areas were increased because the need was not met for those students. And wherever the, the cuts are made, there needs to be a recognition that, particularly if you look at special ed, those are our, our mandated services based on those children's uh, education plans. And so unless the need has significantly changed, there shouldn't be significant cuts to those programs. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about that, but, but this is not just uh, about the moral uh, and, and equitable thing, it's about the legal thing. And, and this really puts the district in jeopardy. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, so, absolutely. So, so I'm oh. sorry, I have to I have to speak to this. No. Absolutely, I agree with Eamon because not you know, I always come because people who know me know I always come from the moral and ethical and value-based way, but this this is illegal. Okay. The district will not be able to meet its legal obligations moving forward the way they have. And I just, and I am deeply concerned, not just as a former board member, but as a citizen and as a parent of children with disabilities. Yeah, so so uh, to give some context to our readers, um, in 2017, uh, the district, um, as it kind of realized the weight of the, the legal obligations it was under to its special education students, convened a, a committee, the board did, um, and Melanie, who was came on the board at that time, was the the chairwoman, co co chair of it, chair right now, chair of it, uh, and Eamon was on it as well. And that that community com committee um, put together a number of recommendations that ended up entering into uh, a pending consent decree, uh, which is essentially um, the district saying we'll agree to do these things, uh, and if we do, then we won't get sued. So, so Melanie, it's, what you're saying to, to restate is. Um, your fear is that the, the cuts involved uh, that the superintendent has proposed here will make it such that the district couldn't possibly meet its obligations. Can you say specifically, what, what are the things that we're missing here? What um, what do they need that they won't have? Oh gosh, we do not have enough time to fully articulate the things that, they, that, that are being cut. No, I'm being very serious. I'm not being facetious in any way. No. My thing is the cuts are sweeping. The fact that they're cutting uh, translation services so that parents can get um, their IEPs, individual education plans for their children in their native language so they can actually understand. The cuts to um, directors of special education, people with specific skills, the cut to the cuts, I mean, I can't, the cuts to programming with people with, for when they're trying to bring children back in district without the requisite um, services and supports to meet the, the things of their IEPs. I mean, there are tons of cuts here. And my and the biggest challenge of this is, is that when you take out the percentage of cuts versus the number of kids, it is disproportionate. I mean, it's illegal, it's disproportionate, it's unethical. Someone's going to hell, okay? So, I mean, I mean I'm sorry to say it this way, but I'm, a, I'm an advocate first. I'm a parent of children with disabilities first. And this is egregious, you know, and I'm being nice with that word, but yes, I mean, they are cutting so many, they're cutting in every single area. That's what I'm saying. I don't have enough time to tell you all the areas because they're cutting everywhere. Mm -hmm. Amen. Help me. <laughs> so, so Amen, um, one of the things that the superintendent has said is a, a justification for these cuts is contractual obligations elsewhere, for instance, class size ratios. So uh, he, he says, I can't very well cut uh, equivalent number of general education teachers because we'll be out of compliance in our collectively bargained contracts. What what other options do you see the district or, or the current board is having if they wanted to restore a large portion of these special education cuts? Well, one recommendation that uh, the Children's Agenda has made is cutting the SRO program. Those are the armed police officers in schools. Uh, that's 1.57 million. That would restore uh, quite a few positions. Uh, the last night's presentation at the board, that was under consideration, but they actually wanted to use that money to hire um, school security officers instead, and actually a, a team of uh, school, school security officers to replace five SROs. So they effectively made it budget neutral, and that was not really the approach we wanted. Um, there, there's still some uh, potential there uh, for some savings. And 
think just being more equitable overall on the distribution of the cuts across buildings. Uh, you know, not to go into uh, strenuous detail, but but really this is very very much concentrated on special education, and I that that argument around um, not being able to to cut in buildings or in other places. Uh, well, right after this uh, announcement of a freeze on state aid, and last night we saw that they are looking to close two schools, so that will increase class sizes. So I, I don't think you can make an argument and then turn around and completely um, change uh, course. So, so clearly there's more more leeway there, and I can't speak to the all the aspects of that. Um, but there there is more room to be more equitable, and particularly at central office, there still has not been significant. Uh, proposals on some of the departments beyond school safety, the, the finance department, uh, the chiefs, um, you know, there can be more cuts to those departments, not that cuts anywhere is good. Uh, they all have a ripple effect, but cutting services for the most vulnerable, the direct supports to those uh, students, that uh, has to be the first priority of restoration and protection. It, it should not be um, a central office job over those kids' direct needs. And something that we need to look at, oh, I'm sorry, something that we need to look at is we can't keep looking at these cuts in isolation. We need to look at them as they fall, because they all relate to one another. So the cuts to special ed in concert with the cuts to social emotional wellness, you know, together you have our most vulnerable children. We have our refugee kids, kid L's, special ed kids, who are also users of social emotional support. You're taking away their ability to get the things in their IEPs and, you're, and the, the, you're taking away social emotional supports for kids who do and even, I mean, this is egregious. You're taking, if you look at these things separately and if, if you look at them separately, they're horrible. But when you look at them all together, they're, it, it exponentially um, increases the harm. I can't, I mean, I know Eamon is an incredible person while talking about the data. I'm, as a mental health professional, I am a, I am a poll. Yeah. The harm that this is going to visit on our children. So let's, let's zoom out a little bit because of course the district doesn't exist in a, a, a vacuum. Um, Eamon, can you talk a little bit about the, the dynamics um, in terms of this state funding and you know, not only this year, which of course is a crazy year, but um, going forward, you know, assuming that the district can can balance and sort of stanch the bleeding as best as it can for 2021, um, what should people know about the, the ongoing district budget dilemma and how it, it possibly could come out of a tailspin? Well, there, there's a, a few different factors at play here, and the most important has been the long-running battle over uh, adequate state aid uh, in the form of foundation aid, uh, which is a formula that the, the state of New York, the regents, actually created themselves about how much funding do you need to give to every district to, to make them successful. And uh, that formula and that amount of money uh, has never been fully funded uh, in the billions of dollars statewide and locally. Uh, it's amounted to, at times, over $100 million, and most recently this year, um, the figure uh, is $86 million. So uh, with that funding, the district would not really be uh, in this position at all. They would, they would be able to maintain programming. Um, so that's, that's a, real, uh, a real issue uh, in terms of how we fund schools more broadly. Uh, and thinking about this current crisis, uh, not the fiscal crisis, but the, the COVID-19 crisis, that is having a, a huge ripple effect on the state budget, the federal budget, the, the county, the city, um, because tax collections going down, everything's really disrupted. And so the, the district's in this terrible position where normally this is when you use your rainy day fund. This is when you actually would be dipping into the fund balance. And unfortunately that, that is not an option. So um, I, I think this is the worst possible scenario and it's likely to improve in future years especially if some of these school closures go through that should uh, cut down a little bit on the structural deficit but uh, the, the big picture in the long term is, is really just about school funding more generally uh, that adequate in Rochester and, and in New York State and stemming the tide of declining enrollment because that's 
uh, to be losing thousands of students every few years. It's very hard to plan and have stable programming. Um, so those are, those are the big challenges. And uh, when we get to that place, I think we can start to really talk about making the district successful and not being in this loop of, of cuts and pain to the most vulnerable kids. Yeah. So, so Melanie, let me um, let me finish our, our conversation here by by circling back to um, your role, your former role on the school board. For for people who are watching this, who have been watching the, the um, school presentations and, and see cuts that they don't like uh, or cuts that they wish were there that aren't, um, what was the most effective way that people communicated to you as a school board member? How how can people make their voices heard on this best? The best way to reach out to be, when people reached out to me, the best ways to get to me um, were to reach out to email me. And all each board member has an email address. It's their first name dot last name at rcsdk12.org. Or you know we and this is the age of Google. You can Google each of us. You could have Googled each of us and found like our work email, found another email, reached out to us on social media. That's what, how a lot of people found me. And you could also give public comment. You know, even though we, we were sitting up there on the dais and we didn't and we couldn't respond, we were listening. I know I was listening. And there were many times I would follow up based upon what I heard from the dais. So all of those things work and. So just keep reaching out. Let people know what you feel because we listen to that. And even though it feels like we're not listening, at least I can speak for myself in my, when, during my tenure, I was listening and we would go into those sessions. I would say, listen to what the people said. But what about what they said? And those and the things that were said in public comment entered into those discussions. Yeah. All right. I, I appreciate you both so much. Um, we've been talking with Melanie Funches, a former school board member and director of community engagement at the Mental Health Association of Rochester and um, education policy manager at the Children's Agenda. Um, uh, you can continue reading. Um, I'll be covering every twist and turn at the Democrat and Chronicle. And as Melanie said, um, important thing people can do, whether they like the budget or not, is let their elected officials know. That's how these things work. Uh, if you have any other questions, feel free to leave them in the Facebook chat here, and uh, one or more of the three of us will be glad to answer them. And otherwise, thanks for watching, and have a great day.